Today's episode is sponsored by Surfshark VPN. Get 83% off and one month free using code DESIGNDOC at the link below. Hey, pick up the phone. It's your old friend, good design, bad design. We're coming at you live on tape with five segments. We're talking about graphic design in games. Things like menus, UI, UX, color choice, font choice, animation, character design, the presentation of information. Oh, and remember for later that good games might have bad graphic design, and vice versa. I have a feeling that might come up in this episode. Who knows? If you have a game we should feature, as good design or bad design, post it in the comments. We've done several segments based on your tips. Let's get started, right after I go on a 60 second rant about Netflix. Did you mine through all the good stuff on Netflix? No, you haven't. Not until you've mined the stuff on international Netflix. How, you may ask? Easily, with today's sponsor, Surfshark VPN. Surfshark is an app and a browser extension that makes it look like you're connecting to the internet from somewhere else in the world. That makes it quick and easy to get around region locking. Open up the client, pick whichever country you want the server to think you're connecting from, and there you go. Now you can check out what's going on on Japanese Netflix, or Philippines Netflix, or practically any other country with just a few clicks. Plus, Surfshark VPN protects your data from unsecure public Wi-Fi, keeps it out of the hands of hackers, and hides it from ominous governmental forces. They're up to something, probably. Go to surfshark.deal slash designdoc and use the promo code designdoc to get Surfshark for 83% off and one month for free. Curl up with some TV you've never even heard of before and protect your security with Surfshark. Bad design. Artwork and UI are not the same thing. We've talked about it before. Games with great, great art, detailed characters, fluid animation, beautiful art direction, can still have real bad UI. Guilty Gear Strive is one of those games, though there is a big caveat. As of this recording, the game is still in beta. We're actually going to talk about both the beta and even the alpha, since they both show great examples of things to avoid. But Arc System Works could still fix it. Man, they need to fix some things. Guilty Gear Strive's characters and backgrounds look incredible, but it's got some weird UI design choices that drag the game down in both form and function. Let's just start with a showstopper, that lobby system. Arc System Works has a tendency to treat their lobby and menu systems like little online hub areas. You get to control a chibi avatar and directly challenge other players within the lobby. I love the idea. It's not always the fastest way to get a match going, but in the past, it's done its job. It's a nice way to chill between matches, and it's cute. But in Strive, it's a functional disaster. Instead of using the game's cast as the avatars, you get a bunch of generic avatar sprites that look nothing like the rest of the game. This whole setup looks like a late 2000s social game. Maple Story crossed with Habbo Hotel or something. Oh, and the news tab on the right takes up over a third of the screen and cramps up the main lobby space. Functionally, the lobby falls apart. The process for challenging players is two steps too cute for its own good. To challenge someone, you have your character draw their sword and face another player with their sword drawn, and kinda stand close-ish to them. Everyone is running around in the same space, friends or not, and can whip out their sword at any time. Challenging a specific player is way tougher than it should be, especially with how crowded the lobbies can be. It's tough to see who you're even standing next to. Oh. And if you get lucky and it does work, there's no rematch option post-fight. Other Arxis games aren't broken like this. Guilty Gear Exert's arcade cabinets and the ring system in Dragon Ball Fighters work just fine. Strive's system is a big step back for usability. I don't know what happened. Inside a fight, the HUD is a problem too. The health bar design is especially weird, and not very useful. Under the health bar, there's a big character portrait and two additional meters, Risk and the burst meter. In normal fighting games, the health bar is simple to see and read. It should have good contrast to be easily seen in the periphery of a player's vision. In Strive, the peach to pink gradient doesn't contrast well with a lot of the backgrounds. The transparent black frame isn't quite enough to fix the problem. Instead, all of the bars move 
and the portrait? What? This bar was actually way worse in the November 2019 build. The risk meter was a drop shadow. A color changing drop shadow. See the problem? No you can't. That's the problem. But you can see the combo counter. And if you can't read numbers, they've got you covered too. Overall, there's a hard tonal shift between the UI, where they were going for a clean and minimalistic style, and the bombastic personality of the game. The UI is a little too basic and plain to keep up with the over-the-top vibe of the characters, and it makes the UI not really fit in, either with the historic style of the series or within its own game. Parts of it kind of fit, but as a whole, the UI just doesn't feel like Guilty Gear. Don't worry though, this is a beta. They've got time to fix it. They have to fix it. They're not going to release it like this, right? Right? Good design. Remakes pose a unique opportunity. A remake can fix problems that you never had time to fix. A remake can let you fix problems you never even found, but your fans had. And if you wait long enough, a remake can allow you to adapt the game to a reality that simply wasn't possible for the original. It could be higher powered graphical chips, or new design sensibilities that had been fire tested in the intervening years, or it could be something as simple as a totally new control scheme. The Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening just got remade last year, and thanks to its move from the Game Boy to the Switch, Nintendo has greatly improved what was already a good game. The original version of Link's Awakening is a classic, a brilliant game with one glaring caveat. The Game Boy has two face buttons. That's all you get. Everything had to be mapped to just those two inputs. Only two of your items in Link's Awakening could be used at the same time, including your sword. Once in a while you'd have an item like the flippers that you could use passively, but for most of them you're digging through your inventory and swapping them out constantly, for combat, and for puzzles. Even the shield, which used to be on Link at all times, had to be assigned to a button. Time travel to the present, and now you have the wide Game Boy. I mean the Switch. Nintendo adapted the control scheme to take advantage. The most commonly used items now have their own buttons. One press for the sword, shield, pegasus boots, and power bracelet. The sword and shield buttons alone dramatically cuts down on how often you have to bring up your inventory. Now you'll just have to juggle items for puzzles, or other more unusual situations. The remake spruces up the UI too. The additional screen real estate and much higher resolution of the Switch compared to the tiny Game Boy screen allow for this super clean interface refresh, which shows the same information and covers up much less of the game world. It also fits in better with the UI direction Nintendo had been taking with the past few games in the series. The game's camera is also much better. Every section of the map is now a flowing, seamless overworld, instead of a bunch of screens that felt like rooms. The areas felt a little samey, and it was easier to get lost. Now the camera can follow the player in a more natural way, which helps the flow of the game's exploration. The camera in the dungeons is still room-based, but it will follow you in the larger rooms. The different environmental styles actually provide a nice contrast between the open overworld and the more focused dungeons that wasn't really there in the original. Link's Awakening's remake is real good. Not every game is lucky enough to be remade, but when they do happen, it's nice to see the developers make the most of the opportunity. Bad design. Remember back in volume... I'll link to it. When we talked about Hyrule Warriors alert design, I found a game with another way to cause the same problem. Alert design is a tricky thing. Alerts that are too quiet or too infrequent can let important information go unnoticed. Just as bad though are constant interruptions. If a game keeps trying to grab your attention over stuff that isn't that important, the alerts lose their potency. It's called alert fatigue. If too many things try to alert your attention, the potency of any one alert gets reduced. Doctors run into this problem if hospital equipment is designed poorly, alerting on too many things that don't require action. The alerts get drowned out into background noise, which can make them miss the actual important bits. The colorful 2008 platformer De Blob is exactly as important, if not more so, as every medical device. And its failure to avoid alert fatigue is exactly as big of a problem. De Blob constantly interrupts players to display new information, and not just in the Hyrule Warriors overload with pop-ups way. No, 
The Blob makes you watch a cutscene. A lot. The Blob is a quirky 3D platformer where you soak up paint from little robots, sometimes you mix them into new colors, and you use the paint to return color to a monochromatic world. It's a little bit Katamari, a little bit Jet Set Radio, and a little bit of that one mode from Tony Hawk's Pro Skater where you're painting the areas you trick off of. It gets repetitive, but it's still very charming, and it's a solid game, except for its addiction to cutscene notifications. Part of the appeal of the Blob is that you can fall into a trance-like state as you go around painting the world, but the game has a very bad habit of knocking you out of it with interruptions. Scattered in each level are a bunch of mission markers. You go up to a marker, get a few lines of dialogue about how horrible it is to be monochromatic and how you should throw a can of... you... on stuff, then start the mission. Every time you complete a mission, you get an unskippable 5 second fanfare, then another establishing shot cutscene that points you to other missions to do. That one's skippable at least, but it still breaks up the flow. They're very short missions, so this happens every 1-3 to three minutes and gets old real quick. The world design isn't complex enough to get lost in really, so the notifications about where new missions are located are redundant, and just add to the downtime. There are only four types of missions, paint a building, defeat enemies, race through checkpoints, or paint a special landmark, which is just paint a big building. So you'll get the gist of what you need to do very quickly, so the cutscenes aren't even needed to explain anything. There's certainly not anything you need to show in a way that locks the player out of controlling their character over and over again. The game tries to deliver some story beats during the cutscenes about liberating an oppressed world, but it's real, real repetitive too. Yeah, the game is geared for a younger crowd, but kids can still figure out how to do a task if they've already done it a bunch of times before. And the kids you're catering to especially won't appreciate stopping the fun to watch a samey cutscene over and over. The Blob would have benefited from a snappier and flowing arcade structure, closer to Katamari or Jet Set Radio. With the constant stop-and-go pacing that the notifications cause, it's much harder to get into the flow of the game. Actually, because the game is less complicated than Hyrule Warriors, taking that game's notification system approach directly might work better. Hyrule Warriors had so much going on that you might miss important information. The Blob's notifications are pretty low stakes, and the game provides other tools like the compass that can get you back on track. With less going on in The Blob, it's harder to miss something important even if the method the game uses to notify you doesn't change. It's a testament to the idea that there's no perfect design. The same approach might be appropriate in one context and inappropriate in another. The Blob could have been stronger if it got out of its own way. Good Design Survival horror games can be really intense. I mean, that's the point, but that intensity has to work with other game elements too. Survival horror games are also about careful navigation, puzzle solving, and item management, and it's tough to think straight with monsters all up in your face. So having handy and reliable UI tools is especially important in survival horror. Resident Evil 2 Remake has done a great job to update its map system to make it one of the best of any game, not just survival horror, it's so helpful in keeping tabs on where you need to go and what you've already done. RE2 involves a lot of retracing your steps through different areas. The Raccoon State Police Department is really a big navigational puzzle. As you find tons of supplies and keys to access new rooms, you'll have to plan things out to travel efficiently. RE2's map keeps track of everything you need. Rooms update all the time as you find items and points of interest, like environmental puzzles and locked doors. The color coding is fantastic. Black for rooms that haven't been explored at all, red for rooms that have been visited but still contain important items or points of interest to deal with, and blue for rooms that you've fully cleaned out. The icons give more specificity for what is left to do in each room and where key items are, once you spotted them. Did you find an herb but don't have room in your pack for it? No problem. The game will make a note of it automatically. This works for puzzles and locked doors too, even down to denoting the specific type of lock after you've examined it. Chains that need a bolt cutter, or locks that require a specially shaped key all have their own icon. The map even marks the open windows that let new zombies in, so you can board them up and create a safer route, if that's how you want to play. It's a tool that gives you more control over strategizing your routes and tactics, and helps narrow down where you need to go next. It goes from a nice to have, to a requirement once the tyrant gets involved later on. The inventory system got refined in the remake too. 
It's not as thoroughly reimagined as the map, but things are much snappier than in the original game. You get better notifications when key items are no longer useful, with this checkmark. The health indicator also gets a nice little upgrade from the original. It notifies you of any status changes after taking damage. No more checking the menu or looking at your character's walk cycle to get that information. It's very minor, but it helps keep the interface from being too cryptic or intrusive. Resident Evil 2 Remake's interface got a major facelift. It's super practical, way more efficient at communicating information, and it all still fits very well with the balance of tension and control that makes up the core of any good survival horror game. Bad design. The new Animal Crossing is real good. There's so much stuff to do. Filling out the museum, paying off and upgrading your house, collecting beach garbage, terraforming and decorating your island. I can really sink well over an hour in here, just doing this. Wait a minute, it shouldn't take this long. Animal Crossing's vibe is charming as hell. It's quaint, it's polished to the max, but its UX is so inefficient. And it has been for 20 years. Maybe a little bit changes from game to game, but at this point, menu inefficiency is a pillar of the series. Right next to Tom Nook. The inventory is where everything happens. Opening and using the inventory is as core to Animal Crossing as jumping is to Mario. But for every game in the series, it's always felt clunky and off. Inventory space has been the chief complaint, and in New Horizons, they've finally gotten around to addressing it. You're allowed to work towards inventory slot upgrades, which is great, but it's been needed for so long it feels like a consolation prize. And that was only one issue. Even with the inventory space expansion, it's still about as slow and clunky to use as it was 20 years ago. Animal Crossing's biggest problem is how convoluted it is to do anything. In a lot of cases, Nintendo uses the extra work it takes to do actions to add a bunch of charm to the game. But not always. Sometimes basic actions that should only take one or two inputs to complete end up taking like five. Let's say you want to plant a few trees. You've got a stack of ten fruits and you want to take three off the top to go plant them by the river and have some space left over to fish a little longer while you're over there. Step... Uh, zero. You need four empty pocket inventory spots to get a stack of one thing. If you only have three slots open, it's way more annoying to do. Step one. Take all 10 fruit out and put it in your pocket inventory. Step 2. Leave the stored inventory screen. Go to your pocket inventory. Step 3. Highlight your stack of 10. Select grab one three times and stack each of those manually onto each other to make your new stack of three. Don't forget to put the leftover fruit back in storage. Okay, time to start your day and it's night now. These issues crop up more with certain features. New Horizon includes a new crafting system, which has been a long time coming and is pretty fun. But the crafting has just as many annoying quirks as the rest of the game's inventories and menus. In order to craft anything, you need materials on you, even if you're crafting in your home with access to your entire storage. So off the bat, you're hopping from storage to the crafting table to make anything. Now with your items, approach the workbench, reconfirm that you want to craft and that you don't want to customize, Pick what you want to craft, and start mashing A to speed through a crafting animation. They had the foresight to allow you to speed up the animation they knew took way too long, but they didn't bother to let you skip that step. Congratulations, you've made a garbage. Do it again if you want another. No bulk crafting, that would be too convenient. Now go back to your pocket and put everything back in the box, one item at a time. Nintendo also brought over everyone's favorite mechanic from Breath of the Wild, Item durability. At least in Zelda, you could argue that it's to get players to use a variety of tools, but a shovel's a shovel. Ain't nothing else gonna dig that hole. Having a shovel, bug net, or other basic tool break in Animal Crossing is a pointless waste of time. Oh yeah, and to craft a nice tool, you have to spend a bunch of time to craft each of the flimsier tools, because they're material components. Like you're dipping this terrible fishing rod in molten iron and getting a good one or something. Don't worry. It'll break too. Animal Crossing's menus waste your time. Sometimes it's done to be charming. Once in a while it is. But way more often it drags the game out and keeps you from doing what you wanted to do. Menu efficiency is not the flashiest topic in UX design, 
but getting these fundamentals right pays huge dividends in the final experience.